Flying Men, and Their Machines, writer, Clarence Arthur Charles Winchester, 1916. In memory of moments spent together in the air, the author affectionately dedicates this volume to his devoted wife, Constance Catherine. Introduction For this story, many years there existed a certain set of progressive and adventurous spirits who, with a small amount of money and a large amount of ingenuity, experimented with pieces of wood, steel, and canvas in order to attempt to solve the problem of aerial navigation. In the early days, these people met with more than their share of discouragement, so much so that it is a wonder to me that airplanes exist at all today in such an advanced condition as they do. In one way, the great European conflict has proved a blessing in disguise to the noble art of aviation. And although war has perforce taken its toll of our brave aviators, and what is more, taken some of the most experienced we of the aeronautical world cannot deny that if there had been no war, the public would still be as skeptical as it ever was concerning travel by air. However, the war brought with it such high praise for aviation from the naval and military authorities that the public could not fail to realize the importance of the good work accomplished by our naval and military flying men, and it is for this reason I have thought it provident to issue a volume likely to appeal to that section of the public which is now taking a new interest in aviation. It will be seen, therefore, that this book pretends to be nothing more than an elementary introduction, suitable for the lay mind, and I would urge this point upon those critics, whose technical knowledge may warrant respect, lest they in their haste should judge me harshly. The public cares nothing for the value of X. Those members of the community who do have already sufficient volumes at their disposal to satisfy their curiosity. For most of the aviator's photographs, I am indebted to Mr. F. N. Burkett of 97 Percy Road, Shepherds, Bush, W., who possesses the finest collection of aviators' portraits I have ever seen. Concerning the other illustrations, many of these I have photographed myself and others have been loaned to me from various sources. I desire to express my cordial thanks to the editors of Flight and the Aeroplane in allowing me to reproduce those photographs duly, acknowledged, and I also wish to express my gratitude to the editors of the Daily Mail, Evening News, Motorcycle, and Tillotson's newspaper literature for their kindness in permitting me to reproduce certain articles from my pen which first appeared in the particular papers mentioned to any other person who has given me the slightest help i offer my sincerest thanks the photographs of pilots are chiefly those of english aviators and one or two of our allied friends and this i think is proper for a publication produced during a period when such profound patriotism is sweeping over the allied forces some restraint has had to be exercised in the selection of airplane illustrations the photographs reproduced deal with pre-war machines only and although i should like to include some of the latest specimens of english workmanship and design it has been thought inexpedient to publish illustrations of the latest craft perhaps germany could not gain much from photographs that display no details of construction but even so it is unwise to run up against the authorities unnecessarily as it is, I am permitted to reproduce the photographs in this book, and I am accordingly grateful for any small mercies I receive during an era when censors are most active and writers most emphatically silenced. I, in conclusion, I wish to impress upon the lay mind that England is no longer invulnerable owing to her position as an island. This we have already seen for ourselves. Therefore, the necessity arises of possess ING at least three aeroplanes to every one of another country. As she already rules the sea, the motherland must now, whilst the opportunity exists, make the supreme effort that will shatter Germany's aerial fleet so effectively that our enemy cannot by any chance either through numbers or efficiency gain the supremacy of the air. Clarence Winchester, Ornus, 1916, Flying Men and Their Machines, Chapter 1, The Early History of Flight, Perhaps, The Real History of Practical, Aviation as Known to the Englishman Commenced, With Bleriot's Famous Cross-Channel Flight in 1909, it must by no means be concluded that flying was not dreamed of long previously. In point of fact, aerial navigation was thought practicable as far back as the 12th century, and ever since then many attempts have been made to copy the birds in their graceful art. It was but 
natural that man, seeing the birds fly so easily and gracefully over hill and dale, river and sea, from one end of the earth to the other, should seek to emulate these feathered creatures, for nothing appeals to the imagination more easily than the idea of traveling through the air on some gigantic bird, or perhaps upon a magic carpet, or something else that will go at wool to any desired spot via that ever-changeful element air. Various weird inventions were made in the early days, some which showed undoubted signs of promise, and others which might well have been at the outset scrapped as hopeless. However, in spite of the great lack of success which at first accompanied man's efforts, the experimenter always proved himself a courageous person, for he was never daunted in the slightest degree until, perchance, fate took an irresistible fancy to him and added his name to the long roll of honor attached to the art of aviation, or attempted aviation, in every century. The first record that can be traced by actual illustration shows us a weird, shell-shaped coracle in which presumably the ancient aviator was intended to sit and attached to this most unique construction were four or five balloonets. Apparently, this attempt foreshadowed the present-day dirigible airship. In the center of the coracle, two masts were erected for the purpose of carrying sails after the manner of a ship. The balloonets were supposed to be filled with a light gas to give the concern support, and the sails were provided to catch the air and thus propel the craft after the manner of the out of today doubt of course man had previously attempted to fly purely and simply under his own power by fitting wings to his body and flapping them up and down in a small elliptical form just in the same way as all birds do it was even quite a long time before the discovery was made that the human being could never be sufficiently strong to support his own weight in the ir and thus at the same time was it proved that the birds are proportionately far stronger than human beings Many were the cases of inventors meeting sudden death by casting themselves from some church steeple or high tower and trying their fortunes on the wings of chance. All of them, of course, soon became possessors of more spiritual wings, although not a few, realizing that discretion was the better part of valor, merely climbed their steeples or towers and then, like wise men, descended by the legitimate stairway or ladder, much to the disappointment of a clamorous crowd which hungered unceasingly after sensation point one man, however, once announced that he would fly over a certain part of the hills north of Brighton now used for races and being confident of. Securing a good advertisement for his projected scheme, he sent out numerous invitations to his many friends in order that they might witness the flight. Thousands of people gathered on the day named to see this wonderful aerial but they neither saw the flight nor had the opportunity of experiencing that intense internal excitement which makes itself evident in everybody when a man sets out with the full purpose of doing or dying in his particular adventure. The great seeker after advertisement, who must have been the forerunner of the modern press agent, merely slid down a wire and flapped two alleged wings as if he were naturally flying, but as the wire could not be made invisible the crowd of onlookers showed great dissent and very Probably the adventurer had to run all the way home and to lock his door securely when he arrived there.